Greetings, it is I, Countess Naravan Jacobin, Lord and Emperor of the Jacobin Empire, and welcome! It is time to continue my discussion on the history of Magic the Gathering, where I go set by set, release by release, product that have come out under the Wizard of the Coast banner for Magic the Gathering, go over information about every last one of them, cards that were released by it, some of the storylines, mechanics that were introduced, things you might want to know about all the various products released from Wizards of the Coast under Magic the Gathering. So today for you, I have the third set in the Alara block, Alara. Reborn. Now it was released on April 30th, 2009. It had 145 cards. It had the themes and mechanics of the fact it was a completely multicolor set, hybrid mana, cascade, cycling, devour, exalted, and unearth. It is the first and only set that has ever been released to be completely multicolor. Every card in the set is a multicolor card. This set is vastly differently numbered and arranged than any set previously. Normally a set would go by the color spectrum, starting from white and going around, then have our multicolored, then have our colorless artifacts, non-basic lands, basic lands, go in that order. This set has no colorless artifacts and no lands of any kind. That's an important factor when we're talking about this. So the set was effectively arranged by first going through the allied colored pairs, the five of them, and each of these sets of allied colored pairs, it would go alphabetically through the cards from that. Then it did pairs of cards that were enemy colors, and of course, in each of those enemy colored combinations, it did alphabetical. Then it went to the three colors that each represented a different shard, and went through those combinations, once again alphabetical, did the five colors, and then did combinations of a one mana, and the hybrid manas, which were the two allied colors of that mana, which we'll talk about that in a minute. This is important to note that of the sets since Planeswalkers were introduced, since it was becoming more of a standard here, this is the only one that doesn't really have any. Since then, pretty much every set has had a Planeswalker after now. But up till now, excluding this one, did not have Planeswalkers. Its symbol is supposed to represent the converging of the five shards of Alara into one plane, Alara Reborn. That is where our storyline focuses on, the fact that Nicol Bolas' scheming has been successful, and that the five shards of Alara are now fused into one plane. But there's a lot of energy and chaos and destruction reigning across all five of these formerly independent shard planes, uh, because of the combination of all of them, and those beings that are now beginning to live in this combined world are finding a, or trying to find some kind of balance, trying to eke a living out on this new Alara, this new reborn plane, as it's coming into existence. So of course it was sold in 16 card boosters, it was also sold in 6 card boosters, very similar to the last one we had, Conflux, it was also sold in 5 intro packs, and a fat pack. The pre-release was on April 25th and 26th, and it had the pre-release card of Dragon Broodmother. The release event gave us the card of Knight of New Alara as a promo card. The all-foil booster that was released on January 8th of 2010, that had foils from all three sets of the block, actually had, which, you know, I wanted to mention, of course, that this was, once again, one of the sets that has it, but it had art from this set of Slave of Bolas. This is the art that they chose for it. Now, of course, the 16th card was either a tip or tricks card or a token. In this case, there were three tips slash tricks cards that could have existed. Plus, then there were four tokens. The to tokens included a 1-1 one, one green red flying dragon with devour. There were 13 possible ads that might appear on the back of these cards. So, Alara Reborn reintroduced hybrid mana, of course, but this was the first time that we saw hybrid mana be placed side by side with regular colored mana, with regular types of mana. So you'd have your hybrid mana and your normal mana symbols next to each other. Always in this case, it would be the center mana of one of the shards, and then the two allied colors of the shards would be the hybrid mana. 
So for example, Bant would be white, while we'd have green and blue as the hybrid mana combination next to it. So all of these cards that were hybrid mana were, though could you could spend two mana to cast them, they were three mana. Cascade was a mechanic that has proven very popular that has been introduced here. It's one of the fan favorites. When I cast a spell with Cascade, I reveal the top cards of my library until I reveal a non-land permanent with a casting cost less than the casting cost of the Cascade spell. So if I cast something with a Cascade of 5, I'm looking for something of 4 or less that's non-land. Once I find it, I may play that spell. If it has Cascade, I can search for the next Cascade spell and play that spell. Effectively, I could continually cascade from one larger thing into smaller things and do this repeatedly throughout the turn to get out multiple things. It allowed for various tricks like that when it came to the cascading. The cards that had been revealed this way, had sort of been exiled this way, are then returned in any order to the bottom of your library. So you cycle through a bunch of cards, get something, cascade it out, and you keep cycling through your deck with cascade. Again, pop their mechanic. Now, of course, we did have cycling return, but we did see a bit of evolution in cycling. Uh, there was a new type of cycling within the Sojourner type of, of creatures. These five creatures had a activated ability when you cycled them, or when they were put into the graveyard from play. That was the exact same ability. So it had two opportunities. Either it dies, put a graveyard from play, or I cycled it, I get this ability. We did also see a land return of basic land cycling. Exalted, Devour, and Unearth, all that had been used in a previous set, coming back. Now, there were 14 cycles within Alara Reborn. It is important to note that unlike many of the other cycles that have appeared in previous sets, that rather than usually having one type of card in them, maybe two, for some things that have instance or sources mixed, some of these cycles often had two types of cards, maybe even three. I'm talking about things like creatures, artifacts, enchantments, all combined together in these cycles. So it was a very unique version of cycles in this set. There were the allied color equipments. These were equipment cards that required a pair of allied colors to play and had a colorless cost in order to equip them. The border posts were common artifacts that you could put into play, usually costing two mana combination in order to play them, or it had an alternate cost of paying one returning a basic land to your owner to its owner's hand from your play, and then you would put this into play tapped. And once it would be untapped, of course, you could tap it for a combination of the two, for one of the two manas in its casting cost. So either mana, mana A or mana B, you would tap it for. The Cascade Commons were, of course, common cards that had a two mana cost with Cascade. Cascade Uncommons were pretty much the same thing. It was two mana cost, Uncommon with Cascade. Very similar to each other. The Cross Shard creatures have a casting cost of two allied colors, and they represented effectively two shards that were adjacent to each other, kind of combining together and a blending between the two of them. The flavor of these cards did at least. The Dual Land Cyclers were common cards that you could, of course, cycle for two mana, but when you cycle it, you do it one of its two basic land cycles. It would have both of its colors in basic land cycle form on the card. So if it was a white-green, you could basic land cycle it for a plains, or you could basic land cycle it for a forest. You'd have to choose which one. Both would cost you two colorless mana in order to do it. The enemy colored commons were, of course, common cards that had a combination of the enemy colors in its casting cost. The hybrid land cyclers were common cards that had a mana cost of two colors, and, and you could cycle it for a hybrid mana of those two colors. So it might cost you a blue and a white, and you'd cycle it for a blue and a, a, blue and a white hybrid mana. The hybrid gold commons were, of course, common spells that had a main mana of whatever shard it was, it was from, plus a hybrid mana of the two allied colors of that shard in its casting cost. There was a hybrid gold uncommon cycle that was uncommon versions of cards that had, of course, the main color of the shard, hybrid mana of the two allied colors in that shard. The Mythic Legends, of course, were Mythic Rarity legendary creatures that had the three colors in their mana cost of the shard they were supposed to be from. The shard color uncommons were uncommon spells that had three colors in its mana cost, which were the three mana cards of the shard it was connected to. The shard blades were two, were common 2-1 creatures that had a cost of the core mana of the shard they were from, plus a hybrid mana of the two allied colors 
of the shard they were from. Each of them had an ability that if you controlled another multicolored permanent, it would get plus one, plus one, and some kind of other ability. So this shard creature, common, as long as I had some other kind of multicolor, gets a little bigger, gets some other kind of ability. The Sojourners were common creatures with three mana in their cost, where these three mana, of course, were the colors of the shard that they were connected to, and each of them had a cycling ability that when you would cycle them, not only would you get the normal cycling for two and the core mana of the shard that they were from, but you would also have an activated effect, and this activated effect would activate whether you cycled this creature, triggered it, or if this creature was put into play from the gra put into the graveyard from play. So effectively, as I said earlier, dies or cycle it, you get its ability. Now this set had two reprint cards, including Terminate. The five intro packs are a white blue one called Legions Aloft, a blue black called Unnatural Schemes, a black red called Dead Ahead, a red green called Rumbler, and a green white called Eternal Siege. Now let's talk about some of the cards from this set. There was Bloodbraid Elf, which was quite popular. It cost you four mana to cost for a 3-2 haste, but it had Cascade. A common combination was Bloodbraid Elf cascading into Lightning, another one from this block. Uh, so again, very popular, very good for a lot of Cascade decks, and fits into a lot of places where it could cascade into a lot of things, being a green-red. There was Qualzali, Pride Mage. It had Exalted, and for one mana you could sacrifice it to destroy target artifact or enchantment. Another pretty popular one for its versatility. Thopter Foundry allows you to pay one and sacrifice a non-token artifact that you have to put a 1-1 one, one blue Thopter artifact creature token into the battlefield and you gain one life. You convert artifacts to Thopters and gain life in the process. Uriel the Miststalker has Hexproof, which we really haven't talked about because it's not yet a keyword. Hexproof is cannot be the target for spells or abilities and opponent controls. So you can target it, opponents can't. Anyway, for... Oral gets plus two, plus two for each enchantment or attached to it. So it's hexproof. My opponents can't target it. And every time I put an enchantment on it, it gets bigger. Eve, Avon Miniomancer has at the beginning of your upkeep, you put a feather counter on a creature. If a creature has a feather counter on it, it becomes a 3-1 creature and has flying as long as that feather token, that feather counter is on it. So it can slowly convert creatures around you to three ones with flying. Behemoth Sledge, it has an equip cost of three and gives a creature plus two, plus two, trample and lifelink. It's the equipment form of Armadillo Cloak. It really is. That's the easiest way to define what it actually is. Brainbite. Opponent reveals their hand. You choose a card from it. They discard that card. You draw a card. Pretty decent one. Cloven Casting. If you cast a multicolor instant or sorcery, you may pay one colorless. And if you do, you may copy that instant or sorcery and choose new targets for it. Dauntless Escort. You may sacrifice Dauntless Escort to give all your creatures indestructible until end of turn. You get rid of this one creature, give all your things indestructible. Deathbringer Thoctor. Whenever another creature dies, you may put a plus one, plus one counter on Deathbringer Thoctor. You may remove a plus one, plus one counter from Deathbringer Thoctor to do one damage to target creature or player. As things die, it gets bigger, and you get rid of those counters just to burn and destroy everything around it. Defiler of Souls. A flying 5-5 five five that at the beginning of each player's upkeep, that player sacrifices a monocolored creature. Really great if you're playing a multicolor and no one else is. In general, it just eats up some other stuff. Deny Reality. Return target permanent to its owner hand. It has Cascade. It means that 5 mana cost is worth it. Dragon Appeasement. Skip your draw step. Whenever you sacrifice a creature, you may draw a card. Works really great in devouring decks as you devour a bunch of things and get a bunch of cards. Dragon Brute Mother, a flying that at the beginning of your upkeep create a 1-1 one, one red-green dragon with token with flying and devour too. So you can create little dragons that devour up everything else and get really big very quickly. Enigma Sphinx is a flying cascade that if it's put into the graveyard from the battlefield, you put it back in your library, third card from the top. So every time it dies, you get it back to, well, cascade it again. Filigree Angel, a flying. When it enters the battlefield, you gain three life for each artifact you control. Playing an artifact deck, you gain a whole lot of life with Filigree Angel. Finest Hour, it's got exalted. When a creature you control attacks alone for the first combat phase during a turn, well, if it's that first combat phase, you then untap it afterwards, and you have an additional combat phase after this one. 
So you attack, and you get another attack. Flurry of Wings create X-1-1 bird soldier tokens that are white, with flying, where that X is the number of creatures attacking. So a whole lot of creatures attack, you get a whole lot of bird token. Glory of Warfare, as long as it's your turn, creatures you control get plus two plus O. Oh. As long as it's not your turn, creatures you control get plus O oh plus two. So during your turn, your creatures are bigger and meaner. Not your turn, more defensive. Identity Crisis. Exile all cards from target player's hand and graveyard. So you just wipe out a hand and a graveyard completely, which could shut down so many decks very quickly. Janara, Ashura of War. A 3-3 flying that for a colorless and a white, put a plus one plus one counter on it. So for two mana, it gets bigger. And the more mana you have, the bigger it gets, the quicker it gets to bigger and bigger, bigger, mean, and crushing your enemies. Avalanche does X damage to target player and each creature he or she controls. So I nuke one of my opponents and all of their creatures. Lich Lord of Unks can tap with a blue, black, and a tap to put a 1-1 one, one blue, black, wizard, zombie creature token in the battlefield. Or for two blue and two black, four mana total. Target player loses X life and puts the top X cards of their library into their graveyard, where X is the number of zombies you control. Blue black zombie deck, anybody? Really mean just oh, mill you into oblivion. After creating a few zombie tokens, Lord of Extinction is a star star creature with power and toughness, those stars, equal to the number of cards in all graveyards. More cards they're in in every graveyard the bigger Lord of Extinction is. Lore Scale Quaddle. Whenever you draw a card, you may put a plus one, plus one counter on Lore Scale Quaddle. More cards you draw, the bigger it gets. Mad Rush Cyclops. Creatures you control have haste. A pretty simple one there, but effective. One of my favorites, if you can sneak into a deck, Maelstrom Nexus. The first spell you cast each turn has Cascade. This is an important one because if you're already playing a Cascade deck, it'll Cascade twice that first spell because it'll Cascade once for Mouse from Nexus, and once if it already has Cascade. I do have a Cascade deck where I can Cascade twice, plus a couple other decks where I can just Cascade and the thing is using it because, heck, rainbow and fun. Maelstrom Pulse. Destroy target non-land permanent, and all other permanents with the same name as that permanent. This shuts down token creation decks. If my opponent has an army of tokens, guess what? They're all gone in one second. Or if they have a playset of something really great, all gone in one second. Mage Slayer. A, the equipment with green, red in its coloring, equip cost three. When a Crypt Creature attacks, it deals damage equal to its power to the defending player. Think about that. I could equip something that's like a 20-20 creature I've pumped up, attack with it, murder my opponent before they even get a chance to defend. Because it's when this creature attacks. As soon as it attacks... It does the damage. It murders your opponent. There's no blocking, no having to actually deal combat damage, because this isn't combat damage, it's just raw damage is dealing to you. Mask of Riddles. Equip cost two. Equip creature has fear, cannot be blocked except by black or artifact creatures. And if equip creature deals combat damage to an opponent, you may draw a card. So it makes it harder to block this thing because fear. And if I do manage to hit someone, I get cards. Win-win. Mariel's Aria. At the beginning of your upkeep, put a plus one plus one counter on each creature you control with a power of five or more. Then, you gain ten life for each creature you control with a power of ten or more. Then, you win the game if you control a creature with power twenty or greater. So, bigger, bigger creatures, gain life, win the game. Mind Funeral. Oh, this one's really nasty. Oh, so very nasty. I have one deck with one in there. One deck where I'm using it, but Mind Funeral. Target opponent reveals cards from their library until they reveal four land cards. On basic land, any four land cards. That player who revealed all these cards put each card revealed this way into their graveyard. You effectively mill an opponent until you mill at least four lands. Everything else in between goes away too. The amount of cards this could get rid of. If you're using the normal ratio of one land to two cards, think about that. Four and eight normal cards, 12 cards. You could easily mill with this for three mana. Mycoid Shepherd. Whenever Mycoid Shepherd or another creature with a power of five or greater dies, you may gain five life. 
So if this dies or any creature of similarly big size dies, you gain five life. Your big creature's deaths mean life for you. Necromancer Covenant. When it enters the battlefield, exile all creature card in target player's graveyard. Any player, yourself, an opponent, whoever it is, exile call creature cards from that, and for each creature exiled, put a 2-2 black zombie creature token onto the battlefield. Zombies you control get lifelink. So you exile a bunch of things, maybe from an opponent's, get a bunch of zombies, give them all lifelink. This is why you need a blue, white, black zombie deck? Nemesis of Reason, another wonderful one from this set when it comes to milling. When Nemesis of Reason attacks, the defending player puts the top 10 cards of their library into their graveyard. Attack six times and you mill your opponent to nothing. Again, another reason that milling is very powerful in these block. Predatory Vantage. At the beginning of an opponent's end step, if that opponent did not cast a creature spell this turn, you create a 2-2 green lizard token. So, if your opponents aren't casting creatures, you get lizards. In a multiplayer game where not everybody could cast a, lizard, a creature every turn, well, I just keep getting lizards, 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 and more lizards. Sages of the Anima. If you would draw a card, instead reveal the top three cards of your library, put any creature cards revealed this way into your hand, and the rest of your bottom, rest of them on the bottom of your library in any order. So you really only get creatures anymore, but, you know, you can get a whole bunch of them in your hand per turn. Send triplets. Nasty one I haven't gotten really used in my artifact deck. At the beginning of your upkeep, choose an opponent. For this turn, that target opponent cannot play spells and plays with their land, their hand revealed. Now granted, this is during your turn, but it shuts down that opponent from doing anything to you during this turn. Now here's the kicker. I may create cards from that opponent's hand as if they were mine. So not only do I shut down you can do anything about it this turn, I get to use stuff from your hand. Granted, it doesn't stop activated abilities they have of something in front of them, but, you know, can't play any cards from your hand and... I get them all. Sickle Captain. Whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, if that creature is a 1-1 one, one creature, put two plus one plus one counters on it. So anything you play that's a 1-1 one, one token or normal creature is actually a 3-3. Three, three. Soul Quake. Return all creature cards and all creature cards in all graveyard to their owner's hand. So you wipe the battlefield, wipe all the graveyards, throw them into their opponent's hands. Throw them to everyone's hands. You get them back, you get them back, you get them back, we all get them back. Sovereigns of Lost Alara is exalted. Whenever a creature control attacks alone, you may search your library for an aura card that could be attached to the creature that is attacking alone, so it has to be able to legally attach to that creature, and you put that into the battlefield, attach to that creature, shuffle your library afterwards. So I give my things exalted, and each time one of my creatures attacks alone, I throw an extra enchantment on it. Something powerful, something great, just throw it on there. Spellbreaker Behemoth. Spellbreaker Behemoth can't be countered. And creatures with a power of 5 or greater that you are playing as a spell cannot be countered. So my big creatures I'm playing can't be countered, and neither can the Spellbreaker. Sphinx of the Steel Wind. Flying, First Strike, Vigilance, Life Link, Protection from Red and Green. Big a lot of abilities, pretty potent. Not bad for the co cost it is. It's also a 6-6, six, six, which isn't, a, isn't something to sneeze at with that kind of cost. Pretty good. Snun Stiper. For 1 mana, tap it. Deals 1 damage to target creature. Tap that creature. So this is a little bit more expensive than your traditional tap, tapping creature creatures, but does one damage to them, which means you can also use this to kill off one ones, or just tap something that's big. A little bit of variety in your ability to tap. Terminate! Destroy target creature! It can't be regenerated. Technically it's the reprint, but I keep wanting to talk about it because Terminate is always good. If you're playing Red Black, Modern, Legacy, whatever, Terminate's excellent. Time Seef. Tap! Sacrifice five artifacts. Take an extra turn after this one. If you have a way of creating five artifact tokens per turn, infinite turns. Otherwise, if you suddenly need an extra turn, tap time sieve, get rid of a whole bunch of things. Well, I suddenly get that extra turn I needed. Trace of Abundance. Enchant land. Enchanted land has shroud. If the enchanted land is tapped for mana, in addition to the mana it would be tapped for, it taps for one mana of any color. So... I enchant this land, I tap it, let's say it's a forest, I tap it for a green, plus I tap it for one mana of any color. So I could get green and white, green and green, green and blue, whatever I want for a combination, I get two from this land now, one of anything, one of green. Unbend of time. Tap to untap another target permanent. So you tap it to untap something else. 
it has a lot of good uses in artifact decks. There are a lot of different things that maybe you want to just untap them, and they're artifacts for a lot of extra power. And it's anti-permanent, so there's a lot of definite places for it. Wargate. Search your library for a permanent card with a converted mana cost of X or less. Put it onto battlefield, shuffle your library afterwards. The reason I'm saying permanent, because it could be anything. Remember, lands have a converted mana cost of zero, so you could search for a land if you really needed one, or you could search for the creature, the enchantment, the artifact, the planeswalker, something that you need and you need it now, and it's a permanent, you could put it into play. But that's it for today. So I talked about Alara Reborn, the final in the Alara block, the set that culminated everything, and a unique set, as it is, of course, completely multicolor. No lands, no colorless artifacts, all multicolor cards. It's got its own unique car uh, system for collector's number. All these unique things about it that make it an interesting set. New versions of hybrid mana. Little things here and there. Cascade, which is so popular. This set brought a lot of things in. A lot of important cards. A lot of interesting cards, which I've talked about. A lot of these cards, which I've been discussing, have gone into decks I own because they are powerful and are good in those decks. Many of them have places in these decks because this set is a powerful set. Is it overpowered? There's arguments to be said about that, about the actual power levels of this in comparison to many others. There is definitely a spike in power here in comparison to some of the older sets. But, as you can see, it's not a lot of its stuff on its own. There's a lot of combinations in Modern and Legacy which really make this the most powerful. And the sheer fact is, again, these cards on their own, powerful? Super powerful? Mmm. Cascade is just a favorite ability. It's a powerful ability that people enjoy. Is it the most powerful ability? Is it the most broken? It's not Storm. That's one thing for say for sure. Not Storm. Anyway. I hope you're having a good day. If you actually have a set that particularly was part of the Alara Reborn set, a, a deck that you made, maybe a Cascade deck, or you just had a Alara Block deck, tell me about it in the comments below. I like hearing about the decks that you've made in the past, or that you might have still. Regardless, though, until the next time, I bid you farewell.